right, so we've got um, about 25 people joining us so far, and I see a few more coming on, but we'll go ahead and kick the event off. Um, thank you so much for joining us today um, here for one of our digital programs at the Tennessee State Museum. Um, we love our Lunch and Learn programs. Um, my name is Mamie Hassel, and I'm on the community engagement team here at the museum. Um, just to kind of kick us off, I am going to go over the housekeeping rules, if you will, um, for the digital program. At the bottom of your computer screen, when you move your mouse over that, there will be a series of buttons that appear, and only two of those are important and relevant um, to us here today. Um, the first one is on the very far left, and that's the microphone icon. And the microphone icon is how you will make sure that you are muted for the duration of the event. You all should have been muted upon entry, so it shouldn't be an issue, but just make sure that there is a slashed line through your microphone, um, and that will guarantee that we're not hearing any feedback or anything on your end. And then the second button that's good to know is the little chat icon. It is third from the right and it's a little chat bubble and if you click that it's going to pull up a chat bar on the right hand side of your screen and in that chat bar you will have the option to send messages and what you want to do is select all panelists and send us a message if you have any tech questions we will answer those there. And also, if you have any questions for Miranda, she will be um, answering those in a Q&A portion at the end of her um, program and presentation. So go ahead and send those there um, as you think of them. Or like I said, let us know if you have any tech questions um, as well. Now, before we get started, I do want to introduce Miranda here. I'm very happy to do so. So Dr. Miranda Fraley Rhodes is our assistant chief curator here at the Tennessee State Museum. She's actually been with the museum since 2006 and leads a great team of staff here in our collections department. And her most recent accomplishment is being our curator in charge of the interpretive planning and the content for our new ratified exhibit, which just opened up a couple of weeks ago, celebrating Tennessee women and their work in gaining the right to vote at the national level. So definitely join me in welcoming Miranda today, and I'm gonna pass it on over to her now. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, I'm looking forward to sharing um, some information about our new exhibit with you. So I'm going to start uh, sharing my program now. So we've just recently opened our new women's suffrage exhibit, Ratified Tennessee Women and the Right to Vote. And that's going to be the focus of my presentation. The exhibit is organized into basically five parts. And it's really great because visitors can sort of move through it in whatever path that they choose. So um, one section focuses on women's search for political rights from the early 1800s up through Reconstruction. Then the, another section focuses on why did women want the vote? And it looks at some of the challenges that they were facing that helped to motivate them to seek the ballot. A large section looks at the suffrage movement in Tennessee. And then we have a very exciting section that focuses on the ratification battle here in Nashville. And then um, our final section in the exhibit, Changing the Political System, explores how women gaining the vote really helped to change the political system in Tennessee and the United States. So, in thinking about Tennessee women and politics, I've tried to look really broadly at women's political activities. And one thing guests will see is that women were acting politically in Tennessee long before they started um, seeking the ballot. Um, so, the lady that you see pictured here is Hannah Richards. Um, she lived in Athens, Tennessee, and she had gained her freedom in 1826 
but she was later arrested and served a jail sentence for, quote, harboring and concealing an enslaved man. And this was likely an individual who was trying to escape from slavery. So we can see her actions uh, really as a protest against the system of slavery. Another Tennessee woman who was definitely acting politically was Sarah Childress Polk. She was the wife of President James K. Polk. And very unusual for her time, she actually served as his private secretary. And her husband placed great faith in her abilities and her judgment. And even though publicly she was always very careful to defer to James K. Polk, um, the reality was that during Polk's time as president, she was one of the most powerful women in American politics. And others recognized that it was a good idea uh, to confer with Mrs. Polk. So um, she was definitely a Tennessee woman involved in politics. And we showcase several other examples in our exhibit. Um, we also explore the national context of the suffrage movement. So, um, the national suffrage movement really was an outgrowth of the abolitionist movement in the North and women's experiences within that movement. Um, both becoming more sensitive to notions of justice and fighting against slavery and experiencing that not always were they allowed to be full participants, even in abolitionist uh, organizations. So we really see um, suffrage for women, that movement growing out of the most radical elements of the abolitionist movement. The first uh, women's rights convention was famously held in Seneca Falls, New York in July 1848. Um, the movement was really diverse from its origins. It included African American and white women and men from the start. So it, it really began by embracing people from a lot of different perspectives. One of the early suffragists and a very famous abolitionist was Angelina Grimke. And here is a quote from one of her writings. So she was very much sensitive to how women were being treated, both in American society as a whole and within the abolitionist movement. So the early suffrage movement experienced a time of great division during debates over the 15th Amendment to the United States Constitution. So what was that amendment to do? Um, as written and as ratified, that amendment granted the right to vote to African-American men. It does not say anything about uh, women's right to vote. And at the time, some prominent women suffragists who had also been abolitionists, like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, objected to that. They thought that women's suffrage should also be addressed in the 15th Amendment, and they refused to support its ratification. In contrast, some other uh, people in favor of women's suffrage, like Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, seen here, and Frederick Douglass, they supported the 15th Amendment and thought that it was critical for African-American men to gain the right to vote at that time, especially due to ongoing racial violence in the South. Um, the outcome of this split was basically two different organizations advocating for women's suffrage. The National uh, Women's Suffrage Association, which was headed by Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, they were leaders in that group. That was seen as the more radical group. And persons who joined that tended to be among the ones who opposed the 15th Amendment. 
The American Woman Suffrage Association, in contrast, tended to attract um, individuals who had supported the 15th Amendment and who might be a bit more conservative in their views. So um, there really was not activity before the 1870s in the women's suffrage movement per se in Tennessee. So one of the questions we really wanted to look at with the exhibit was if the women's suffrage movement started in the 1840s, why weren't Tennessee women engaged in it then? And then why did they start to participate in the movement in the 1870s? And that has a lot to do with slavery. Um, because the national movement had its origins in the abolitionist movement, there was really very little participation by women in the southern states until later in the 1800s. But that doesn't mean that Tennessee women weren't having some experiences during this time that would cause them to think about the value of having the ballot. So um, during the Civil War and Reconstruction, Tennessee women had many different perspectives on these events. Some women supported the Union, some women supported the Confederacy. Um, during this time period, we see African-American women um, gaining new rights, especially with the end of slavery. And just there are a lot of things about women's lives that are changing their interactions with government officials and with um, all sorts of aspects of their lives. And in some cases in the war, even with military officials, women are very much having a more direct relationship with government than they had in the past. And government is really impacting their lives. So this is part of what leads Tennessee women to start thinking more about the vote. Also, certainly the experience of women having to manage households in the absence of men, with men away fighting in the army. Um, many women who lost male family members and that then face having to support themselves as wage workers. That also is influencing women's perspectives and also the politics of reconstruction. So, um, as we move into the 1870s and beyond, Tennessee women really have both new opportunities and new challenges. More women are entering the workforce, but there are problems with that. Um, this photo actually shows um, uh, girls who were at work at a hosiery mill in Cleveland, Tennessee. So uh, child labor was one of the many issues that women were facing and they realized that they did not really have the same tools as men did legally at that time to address some of their concerns. So why did women want the vote? And this image shows a few into our new exhibit. I'll be sharing some images from the exhibit floor uh, throughout my presentation, uh, just to give y'all kind of a, a view and a perspective on that. So um, why did women want the vote? They were realizing some of the challenges that were really impacting their abilities to operate in their world. And um, they were facing many legal limitations at this time. For example, when a woman married, her husband automatically gained ownership of her property. And also, work, working wives did not even own their own wages. Mothers did not have an equal voice in their children's upbringing or in legal rights to their children. So uh, women were actually excluded from serving in some professions and from running for many elected offices. Only men were allowed to serve in many roles. So um, if women had the vote, 
that would be one tool to help address some of these issues. So let's look at some of the constituencies of women recognized by early suffragists. University women. Women were beginning to gain more opportunities to pursue higher education. And suffragists nationwide re recognized university women as an important group in their movement. Women in education. So this is the time period when many women are becoming public school teachers. And we're starting to see majorities of public school teachers be women. So they're both um, earning wages as teachers. They're serving as educational leaders. And this is a great time of education reform. This is when people are advocating for compulsory attendance laws and all sorts of changes are occurring in the educational system within Tennessee and women are very much involved in those efforts. Women as workers in their homes, on farms, and in businesses. So women were very much contributing to the welfare of their families through both paid and unpaid labor. On farms, women had many tasks that they used to contribute to their families' work there, uh, with the farm being their workplace. And during this time, we're also seeing increasing numbers of women leaving the home to work for wages in businesses. And it was very much recognized that women workers needed the vote as a tool and part to protect themselves within the workplace to have a bigger voice in the laws about uh, working. And suffragists recognized uh, women workers as a constituency. In some communities, business women formed their own suffrage league. So now let's take a look at our exhibit area that focuses on the Tennessee suffrage movement. And I'll say this was such an exciting part of the exhibit to research and develop because it, it was really wonderful to get to learn more about the stories of Tennessee suffragists. And we really worked hard to offer a statewide story and to really share some of those lesser known stories about our state's suffrage history. Because this really was a movement that embraced women throughout the state. And um, we're glad to get to share some of their stories with you. So, as far as timing is concerned, beginning in the 1870s, we see individual women within Tennessee um, stepping forward and beginning to ask for the vote. Then, by the 1880s, we start getting the very first suffrage leagues forming, and the first ones actually began in Memphis. By the 1890s, the first state suffrage organization, one of a series, is formed. And then by 1910, and really forward from there, we see the movement expanding rapidly in the state. Now, it's important to recognize that the suffrage movement in Tennessee included African American women, white women, women from many different perspectives. However, during this time of racial segregation, many African American women um, were not accepted as full partners by white suffragists. Um, most of the suffrage leagues were white women's organizations. However, that in no way means that African American women were not also advocating for the vote. They tended to advocate for the vote within African American women's organizations. And one of the things we do in this exhibit is highlight 
African American suffragists and African American women's participation in general in organizations that are really working for uh, community improvement, community goals. There's a big push during the late 1800s for African American women and white women to move more into the public sphere and to start advocating for goals that in many cases um, bring them into politics. And one of the very important organizations involved in that, we're going to talk about a little bit further in the presentation, was the Women's Christian Temperance Union. So here is a statement from Lloyd Merriweather, who was a very early Tennessee suffrage leader. And um, this is an excerpt from a longer uh, document, but she's giving some reasons why Tennessee women are asking for the vote. As taxpayers, they claim the right to representation, hearkening back to the American Revolution, no taxation without representation. Married women want the basic right to own their own clothes. At that point, they did not. Um, married women who worked for wages wanted to own their earnings. And mothers wanted an equal say in their children's futures. So, here is a quote from Frances Willard, who was the national president for the Women's Christian Temperance Union. This group was really critical to the suffrage movement in general and in Tennessee. So, um, the national WCTU came out in favor of women's suffrage uh, fairly early. Now, the Tennessee uh, WCTU, they were a bit more conservative regarding suffrage. But one thing this group did was it really encouraged women who did not think of themselves as radical reformers to get out and start advocating for their cause, especially church women, right? Um, so temperance was a very important issue in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And many women in the state joined the WCTU and started to advocate in favor of laws restricting um, alcoholic beverages. Another feature of the WCTU that makes it very interesting is though its chapters were segregated, there were African-American women's chapters of the WCTU in Tennessee and also white women's chapters. So um, there were women from different races involved in this organization and they were advocating very much for the cause of temperance, which very quickly brought them into politics. And one interesting uh, thing to note is the, industry, the liquor industry consistently opposed women's suffrage because they expected women voters to vote against them and to vote in favor of measures like prohibition. So let's talk a bit more about African-American women and the suffrage movement. So African-American women very much saw votes for women as something that they wanted to advocate for. And at the same time, they were also protesting against limitations put on African-American men's right to vote. Um, so the women's suffrage movement in Tennessee and really throughout the South was occurring within the context of uh, disenfranchisement measures passed intended to limit African-American men's right to vote. And these included measures like poll taxes. So there were these different struggles going on. And African-American women suffragists very much opposed these measures that were limiting African-American men's right to vote. Now, some white suffragists did not oppose those measures. And that was another area of division within the movement. 
Um, one aspect of our exhibit that I also wanted to point out, we do have a free gallery guide available for a guest in the exhibit. And it features a story for every Tennessee county related to women's political activities in the state. And don't worry if you're not able to join us in person. This information is also presented online in the ratified statewide exhibit available on the Tennessee State Museum's website. And this is presented on the website as an interactive map where you can click on the different counties and their stories and related images will come up on your screen. So uh, please uh, explore that either with us here in person or online. And um, the, doing the research for that was so meaningful. And one of the things it really demonstrated was how votes for women was a topic that Tennesseans throughout the state were debating, both for and against. It's like in communities in East, Middle, and West Tennessee, this was an issue. And it really showed the engagement of the public in this question of women's right to vote. And I just wanted to share a few examples of some of our stories related to different communities throughout the state. So Maryville had a really interesting suffrage tradition in that community. Um, the lady shown here, Mary Wilson McTeer, she was active both in her local suffrage league and in the state suffrage association at the time. She was such an avid suffragist that she requested to be buried with yellow and white suffrage emblems. Maryville College also had a suffrage league for students there, so there was a lot of suffrage activity in Maryville. Giles County was also very active regarding the women's suffrage movement. So local adult women had their own suffrage league. There was a league for uh, young women at the high school there in Pulaski, and Martin Methodist College also had their own league for college students. And it's very important to note that uh, Pulaski suffragists, they met at the courthouse um, for Giles County, showing sort of their access already to uh, community government. And they were very active in visiting their neighbors, um, distributing literature about their cause, and also keeping records of how the members of each family felt about votes for women. Shelbyville was a bit different situation. The suffragists there encountered a lot of resistance. So they tailored their strategies really to appeal to people in their communities. So um, they really focused on advocating for votes for women through the school. They sponsored debates for school children and also put forward two of their suffrage league members as candidates for the local board of education. So suffragists throughout the state really tailored their strategies based on the situation in their local communities. One of the challenges that suffragists faced was contesting negative stereotypes concerning basically the idea of women sort of stepping out of their domestic roles and into public life. Um, a lot of anti-suffrage cartoons and literature um, show images of men basically being forced to take care of children and uh, wash the clothes while the women go off to vote. So there was this sense that women getting voting rights would totally upset the gender norms for the day. And Ann Dallas Studley, shown here with her daughter Trevania, was someone who really worked to contest those negative stereotypes. And Ann Dallas Studley served as an officer both in her local Nashville Suffrage League and the state suffrage organization and in the National American Woman Suffrage Association. So she was a national suffrage officer. 
And she often appeared with her children um, to help contest these ideas of suffragists being anti-family. Suffrage banners were very important to suffragists. And this one shown here is actually featured in our exhibit. It's one of two that were conserved, especially for this exhibit. So suffragists used these banners in parades, and they really saw them as important and treasured symbols of their organization. So suffragists in Tennessee did not always agree on the most effective strategy. We see some suffragists in Tennessee who are very much aligned with the National American Woman Suffrage Association, which was nonpartisan and um, tended to be maybe a bit more on the conservative side. We see others like Sue Shelton White, who eventually moved to the National Woman's Party. Um, and they're picketing the White House. Sue Shelton White is arrested um, for one of the protests she's involved in in Washington, D.C. And the suffragists uh, just don't always agree about the best way to advocate for their cause. And they're pretty open about those disagreements and, um, and sort of debating about the best strategies to use. So there was a lot of diversity of opinion within the state in that regard as well. So World War I was really a critical event for the suffrage movement. Um, the National American Woman Suffrage Association very much came out in favor of the war effort, volunteered its members for service, and many Tennessee suffragists, especially women who were prominent in the movement, were also very active in the World War I effort. Uh, the National Women's Party took a different track. They continued to focus on the suffrage uh, and achieving that through federal action and maintain their protests at the White House during the war, which many persons saw as unpatriotic, including some other suffragists. So there was a lot of controversy over that. President Woodrow Wilson was a rather reluctant uh, advocate of suffrage. He finally came out in favor of an amendment to the Constitution for women's voting rights. And women's war work for the war effort really did seem to have a big impact on Wilson. He basically presented his support for a suffrage amendment as a war measure. Um, and here is an image of Sue Shelton White and the National Women's Party, uh, other members of that in uh, Washington, D.C. And Sue Shelton White is talking about how she felt it was important to continue protesting. Now, Tennessee suffragists gained a great victory in 1919 when the Tennessee General Assembly passed a law which granted Tennessee women the right to vote in presidential and municipal elections. This was really remarkable for the South. Few Southern women had these uh, opportunities and Tennessee suffragists celebrated this victory. They went to register to vote in the 1919 elections. And um, at, this is when they even started transitioning towards a Tennessee League of Women Voters um, organization. So they were very excited about this. And one important thing to note related to this new law was in Nashville especially, there was cooperation between African-American women suffragists and white women suffragists when it came time for the 1919 municipal election. They worked together to support reform candidates. Um, 
Gino Frankie Pierce, an African-American suffragist from Nashville, was very active in the movement. And she actually spoke in 1920 at the suffragist conference at the Tennessee State Capitol, where they were transitioning from the Tennessee Woman Suffrage Association to the Tennessee League of Women Voters. And Ms. Pierce was advocating for especially more services for children in the state. And she had a very important voice in the movement. And some of her uh, causes, they came to pass later in time. So a very important advocate for Tennessee children. So it was really a surprise that Tennessee became the deciding vote in the 19th Amendment's ratification. There was a clause in the state's constitution that forbade legislators in the, the state legislature from voting on federal amendments sent to the state after those legislators had been elected to the General Assembly. But the U.S. Supreme Court struck down that type of restriction and Governor Roberts agreed to call a special session. So, um, Catherine Kenney, shown here, was on the ground in Nashville. She helped organize for ratification. She was the ratification chair for the League of Women Voters. And before that special session, Tennessee suffragists throughout the state are visiting legislators in their home communities, advocating for the 19th Amendment. Um, we also have national suffrage organizations present here in the state, both the National Women's Party and Carrie Chapman Catt, the president of the National American Woman Suffrage Association was here in Nashville. The anti-suffragists are also very much in this fight. The Tennessee anti-suffragists were led by Josephine Pearson, shown here, and really many anti-suffragists from other states come to Nashville to help fight against ratification. So the Tennessee State Capitol really becomes the focus of attention throughout the nation. How are legislators going to vote? Ratification passes easily in the Senate, but in the House, it is really too close to call. And on August 18th, after two votes to table the amendment, where they wouldn't even really vote on it, um, uh, failed with a tie vote, the amendment finally comes up for a real vote. And a young legislator named Harry T. Byrne from McMinn County um, really becomes famous at this time. So let's look a little bit at the story of Feb Byrne and Harry T. Byrne. Feb Byrne, Harry T. Byrne's mother, had recently written a letter to Harry and asked him to help um, Miss Cat and support ratification. So this was very timely advice from her. And um, Harry T. Byrne really becomes a critical vote needed to pass the 19th Amendment. And he has had been seen previously as voting usually with the antis, but when it comes right down to it, he votes in favor of ratification, and Tennessee becomes the 36th and final state needed to ratify the 19th Amendment and make it the law of the land. So this is a very uh, exciting time for Tennesseans and a critical vote by Harry T. Byrne. Um, and that really was something he faced a lot of criticism for, and he referenced the importance of following the advice of one's mother. So the 19th Amendment is ratified. There's both great excitement about this and a backlash against it. So controversy continues. And there's the sense that women may really be a critical factor in the November 1920 elections. 
So um, women are voting. How are they going to vote? Um, this is a, a very exciting time. And ratification also opens up other new opportunities for Tennessee women. So women begin to seek elected offices in Tennessee. Um, Ann Worley was elected to the Tennessee Senate in 1921. And she filled the seat vacated by her husband who had passed away. She sponsored legislation which would remove legal restrictions from women holding public offices in Tennessee. And this did pass, clearing the way for more women to serve in government. African American women continue to face many challenges to voting. But um, one of the exciting things that we've seen in our research for this exhibit is despite the many barriers they faced, including things like poll taxes and all the other measures that had really been put in place to disenfranchise African American men, African American women worked hard to vote. Um, in looking at poll tax records, from East, Middle, and West Tennessee, we found evidence of African American women who were paying their poll taxes and really standing up to a lot of racial discrimination in order to exercise their right to vote. This is a quote from Nanny H. Burroughs from the Murfreesboro Union. Um, and in he, this quote, she's talking about really the relationship between the 19th Amendment and the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. So very important. Um, uh, these were all very important measures as far as rights, especially civil rights. So just in conclusion, in thinking about the 19th Amendment, how did this amendment transform women's roles in politics in Tennessee and the United States? One really important thing to consider is that it certainly did not resolve all issues about women's right to vote. Um, Asian American women, and Native American women did not gain the right to vote under the 19th Amendment, and they continued to face um, a struggle to gain those rights. African American women experienced many challenges and barriers to exercising their right to vote. Um, however, despite those things that the 19th Amendment really did not fully address, it did bring about some important areas of change. One of the things it did was it, it changed women's status in the political system as a whole. It made them constituents rather than outsiders who might request some type of political action, but who couldn't vote. Now, many women were able to vote for their leaders and that made a big difference when it came to advocating for issues that were important to them. So being a voter really did make a difference in both women's opportunities to serve and in their roles in their communities. And I want to just thank all of our audience again. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I'm looking forward to talking with you about your questions. So um, let's um, move to questions at this point, if we may. And I'm going to stop uh, sharing my screen. All right, thank you so much, Miranda. That was wonderful. I'm taking over now. I'm Joyce Gununez, um, and I'll be leading the questions. So we're going to get started with one of the first questions that came in, and they want to know, can you talk about the origins of the term suffragette? Um, because oftentimes it's believed to be a diminutive term. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about that? 
Well, I can address that a bit, yes. Um, so suffragette, that tends to be associated more with the suffrage movement in Great Britain. And yes, it was seen as a pejorative term. And um, in our exhibit, we're very careful to use the term suffragists. Now, in the time period, like if you look at newspapers from Tennessee from um, the 1918 to 1920, you'll see the term suffragette used sometimes, but that really pertained mostly to the British movement. Okay. Um, and they also want to know, was the vote, uh, or sorry, was it always seen as disrespectful, the term suffragette? I think that eventually some persons came to embrace it, but it, it was, from what I understand, intended to be um, not positive. Yeah, I could see that. I do think it's more commonly known now, but um, okay, next question. Um, I'm going to take it from here. Do we, do we know if Josephine Pearson voted after women got the right to vote? That is a wonderful question. And I'll tell you, I don't know specifically about Ms. Pearson. But a really interesting thing happened with anti-suffragists. So it, it's almost like after women got the right to vote, um, anti-suffragists were like, hey, we have to vote too, or we're not going to be able to get our perspective across. And anti-suffragists actually waged campaigns against some of the politicians in Tennessee who had supported suffrage, like Harry T. Byrne. And um, he was a Republican a legislator from East Tennessee, but um, basically suffragists from other parts of the state went into his district to help advocate for his campaign because he was getting so much uh, anti-suffrage attention um, that the suffragists really stepped up to try to help him. Um, so the anti-suffragists did not shy away from politics after ratification by any means. That's funny. They were like weaponizing their vote. Um, now, Ashley, our director, wants to know if you have a favorite story uh, from the 90, uh, the 96 counties that you discovered. Well, there are so many. Um, let me think about what would be a favorite. Um, uh, one of my favorites is the Fayetteville Equal Suffrage League. And um, that league reported that they had entered a, a decorated automobile in their community's 4th of July parade. And they were so excited because they won a $50 prize. And they didn't have very much money. And they used that money to join the state suffrage association. And they were also looking towards projects like getting their own suffrage banner. And I think that just shows how creative Tennessee suffragists were and how really women throughout the state were working hard for those opportunities to participate in the movement. That's really sweet. Um, let's see. So someone wants to know why the vote in the Senate was a landslide, but in the House it was so contested. That's a great question. And I don't know that there's a totally definitive answer, but I'll tell you something that may be very much an indication. So A.L. Todd, who was the speaker in the Senate, he was pro-suffrage. There's actually a great document at the Tennessee State Library and Archives by a Murfreesboro suffragist that talks about her work with him. And he was the leader in favor of ratification in the Senate. And there was little opposition, right? In the House, a Seth Walker, the House Speaker, suffragist thought he was going to lead the movement in favor of ratification, but then he suddenly changed sides and led the antis. 
And um, that was definitely a factor in how events played out in the house. That's interesting. Um, someone else wants to know, was there a difference among the three grand divisions in how um, they fought for suffrage? Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question. I'll tell you a couple of interesting things that we've discovered from our research. One is really the depth of the suffrage movement in Tennessee. It really did engage women in urban areas, in small towns, all over the place. Fev Byrne was from a very rural area, and, and you know she played a critical role. Um, one interesting thing is, you see in East Tennessee, more leagues that seem to affiliate with the National Women's Party. Um, and I've been really interested in how active suffragists were in West Tennessee. It's like Union City was a center of suffrage activism. It, it really was a statewide movement, and it's been so exciting to explore how that evolved. And region did definitely become an issue among suffragists in the state when it came time to host the National Conference for the National American Woman Suffrage Association. Um, there were two statewide organizations for a while in Tennessee because of a disagreement over where to have that conference. And they did reunite um, in 1918 into one statewide organization. So uh, Tennessee suffragists definitely were very conscious of reaching. And that was important to them to feel that their communities were represented and their voices were being heard. I have to say, I'm very impressed at all of the research that you've done to try to represent all of the counties in Tennessee, because that had to have been a feat. And I'm just impressed by that whole, the whole endeavor. Um, well, and uh, thank you. And if I may, I'd also like to compliment um, Aubrey McDaniel, who worked with us as an intern, and she helped with that project and just did wonderful work in regards to finding some of those stories. And I, I so appreciated all of her work. You did a great job. Um, I have another question here that's really interesting. Uh, someone's saying that. Uh, her grandmother uh, was born in 1968, and she never exercised the right to vote um, because she believed that politics were for men only. Um, do, do you know how long it takes for a greater number of women to start voting and be involved in that voting rights? That's a great question. So the 19th Amendment made voting rights for women, um, you know, the law, but it did not automatically change attitudes. So, um, for example, um, in the 1920s, you get some um, newspapers still saying that basically they know that the good women in their community don't really want to vote that they should probably go and pay their poll taxes because they support education. Um, I know Debbie Shaw, who was one of our members of our exhibit team, um, she found some really interesting things in that regard. And um, Sue Shelton White, who began to work with the Democratic Party, um, uh, so she commented on basically continuing resistance to women voting, and especially when it came time to pay poll taxes. So women started having to pay poll taxes in Tennessee in 1922. But in a lot of families, they didn't control the finances. So if their husband or father didn't let them have the money to pay those taxes, they didn't vote. And that, that was a reality for many women. So it, it, it's like, um, uh, there were very much uh, continuing ideas about uh, 
questions concerning whether or not it was appropriate for women to vote even when they had the right to do so. Yeah, I know ver voter or registration turnout was still pretty high, though. So I think there were a lot of people that were still wanting to vote. Um, I also might have misspoken, which is just a slip of the tongue. Uh, her grandmother was born in 1898, and I might have said 19 uh, something that happens to me all the time. Anyway, um, we want let's just throw in one more question. Um, I I was curious um, as to um, I know that Tennessee did have polling taxes, um, but were there other forms of restrictions um, that were used within the state for voting? Well, in general, the whole system at that time had been sort of constructed to uh, have barriers that would disenfranchise, especially African-American men. And this really started in the 1890s, laws related to this. And um, some of them are things that maybe wouldn't seem um, surprising to us today. Things like secret ballots. But at that time, many people didn't have the kinds of access to education that they really wanted. And if you require someone to have a secret ballot where they have to be literate and they didn't have the opportunity to go to school through no fault of their own, that person has just been disenfranchised. So yeah, there were a lot of different kinds of, of rules that could lead to people not being able to exercise the right to vote. And really one um, a consequence of the 19th Amendment was that that system started to break down because suddenly the number of potential voters just doubled. And um, certainly the barriers don't immediately go away, but you have women's groups out there that are encouraging people to register to vote and they're publishing information about this is how you can be eligible to vote. And it's, it's kind of a, a beginning. Okay, thank you so much for that, Miranda, and I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, thanks for, for everyone who joined, and I'm going to end this, stop the recording. <laughs>